Hello and welcome back to the channel. My name is Jaren and this is another episode of D&D Behind the Scenes, a show where I pull back the curtain and you get to follow along with me as I prepare a session of 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons. Now I'm still running the official adventure Spelljammer Light of Xerixis, but we're taking a break this week because I've got a player down. Uh, not down, down, just not going to be here. And I told my party, I told my players... Because I was kind of tired of not running something. There was a couple of weeks in a row where we didn't have a session because just it's summertime and schedules are a little harder to coordinate. Um, and I just said, hey, I'll do the extra work. I'll run something even if that's a one shot. So sh today should be an interesting experiment um, because it's been a while since I've prepped a one shot. And uh, this is someone else's content, so it'll be dually uh, interesting. Um, so today we're going to run a one shot called Temple of the Bas Basilisk Cult. Um, you can pick up this adventure, this one shot, completely for free on the Arcane Library's website. At least it was when I picked it up. It probably is still for free. I think all you got to do is sign up to be in the email distribution, and then you get this awesome adventure. And it comes with maps, uh, a really nice and easy to read PDF, all the stuff that you want from a, a, a one shot. Um, and I'm really uh, looking forward to this adventure. This is the same creator that made the recent uh, RPG Shadow Dark. Um, which has been wildly popular and I've heard really good things about. So I'm excited to see how this goes. So today should be a little bit uh, interesting. I've done a little bit of the legwork already in, in putting some pieces into Roll20, and I might not even use uh, Notion for my notes because I think it's just going to be... It's 6 o'clock already my time. I've got D&D &D in an hour, and it's going to be just as quick, I think, rather than copying uh, a pretty well-organized PDF into my Notion uh, for reference. It's probably going to be just as easy to look at the PDF. So let's do that. Um, now, as mentioned, I've already done some of the legwork. Uh, I do what I always do here, and I, I create a page for tokens just in case I need a quick and easy place to go and grab some uh, some tokens that I've already made um, that have all the correct settings, except I guess in this case, I don't really have many token settings. And then I have two pages. These are the only two maps that are in uh, in this module. So there's not a whole lot of prep that I had to do. Let's take a look at the PDF. Um, so Temple of the Basilisk Cult uh, by Kelsey Dion. Um, beautiful table of contents. Uh, gives you uh, some synopsis, uh, some advice for the DM. Give you some idea on pacing. Uh, some bullet points. This is what you want. You don't want a bunch of lengthy paragraphs having to read some lore. You want bullet points, quick and easy to read. I don't want to spend half an hour reading through an adventure that's going to take me three hours to get through. I want to glance at this in 10 minutes and skim it and go, okay, I, I know basically what's going on. So I think this is pretty good. We begin, the, the whole main point of this, I think, um, players are uh, helping to explore some archaeological dig site. Where did my page go? I've got way too many pages open here. Nope, that's the, that's the image. Uh, they are exploring this archaeological dig site called Mivin's Rest. And there are a couple of NPCs already here that can uh, assist them in this journey. Um, this is all surrounding this weird basilisk cult. They're going to find the dig site that's been sort of already uh, dug up a little bit. Um, and pretty soon, like right as soon as we kind of find out where the players are within this dig site... We jump straight into the action with combat as these uh, stone uh, stone warriors, thematic to basilisks, uh, pop out of the uh, the forest and start attacking the party. Some of them start throwing uh, flames, trying to burn the campsite down. Uh, ultimately, what they're trying to do is, uh, these stone warriors are trying to do is uh, collect this jade basilisk egg that has been dug up from this sarcophagus here. And they want to take it back to their temple and complete this ritual. So we jump right into combat. Players are getting attacked. It's dangerous. Um, we find out that, uh, you know, hey, hey, there's something. It's not just let's go to this cult, uh, you know, ceremonial uh, site, ceremony site. <laughs> uh, we have some things to fight and we have to go, uh, like, collect this egg before they complete their, their thing. Um, we then... And, and as you can see in the PDF, um, it's got a lot of like really good descriptions, um, some really easy to read bullet points. Um, what I now realize I'm appreciating now that I'm going through the prep here is the color coding is fantastic. Um, I know that uh, bold 
is sort of something I need to pay attention to. And red is something that could like definitely come into play. Potion of healing. Um, I, other places there are um, actual, you know, the, the, the monsters I need to pay attention to are, are put into red. So I know I need to have Basilisk Hatchlings uh, tokens ready. Um, one thing I forgot to do, I need to make some guard tokens. But I really appreciate this. It's really easy to read at a glance. I don't have to go digging through piece by piece. I can look at it pretty quickly. And that's why I don't think that it's going to be uh, very time efficient to try and put this info into my own Notion bullet points. Um, the only reason I would do that is if I was going to run this adventure again at some point in the near future. And I didn't want to have to dig through this PDF. I could just already have these notes ready to go. But I think this is just as easy anyways. Um, so I need to get a couple guard tokens onto the map. Uh, now what you get when you download this, let me see if I can pull this up here. Go to Basilisk Cult. Um, you get, uh, well, you got a lot of really great stuff. Some things that I'm not even going to be using. Uh, if you don't want to go searching through these, um, through the PDF, the, the, there's even these really nice, uh, where is it going to pull up now? Uh, these nice and quick and easy to read combat cards. Uh, if you don't want to go back to the PDF, you can just, if you're going to run this in person, this is what I would do for sure. Uh, print these out, cut them up. These are the printer friendly ones. Um, there are probably some color friendly. Uh, yeah. Let's take a look at these. Uh, yeah. Also included in this download. Um, these really nice combat cards. There are also uh, PC combat cards. Um, so if you wanted to give these out to your players, that would be kind of nice. Um, make it a little easier to, to keep track of their stats if you had some brand uh, had some newer players. Um, what else do we have? We also have these really awesome maps. We have both uh, labeled maps and these uh, maps that are more for like your players to look at. Uh, what I've uploaded here into Roll20 is the, the player version, I guess you could call it. And then, um, do I have this open? I might already have this open. Yeah, if we were to look here, here is the labeled map. And I've taken, because you obviously don't want your players to see these numbers. And S is where all these monsters uh, begin. They kind of emerge from the forest, the jungle. Uh, so you want the, the one that doesn't have all this info on it. And then I took all this. And as you can see here, I've put all this information, including where these stone warriors begin, and I plopped it onto the GM layer. And that is both, uh, well, it's mostly, it's entirely for my own reference. Um, so that if I, because, you know, this is a new adventure to me and I'm, I'm less familiar than if I had been looking at this for multiple weeks. Uh, I'm trying to follow along in the spirit of like, these adventures ought to be written such that you can look at it, take maybe a half an hour to an hour to read through, do your prep. And it shouldn't be terribly difficult to have a good idea of how to run it, where things are, what they are. And so I don't want to have to memorize all the stuff. If, if, if it comes to it, I want to be able to look at this and go, okay, area one, what was in area one again? Oh yeah. Uh, we can just quickly go back to the PDF, just to get a real quick reminder. Yep, it's just some tents. It's not a lengthy paragraph that I had to read a bunch of lore about. It's just tents. Um, this NPC, Grand Reskin, Area 2, uh, really easy. I know that this, you know, some more tents. There's a, a campfire here. Here's the uh, the dig site. Um, so it's, it's really quick and easy to do. Uh, I appreciate how everything is organized in this PDF. Um, we even have notes for a uh, transition. Oh, I needed to get some guard tokens. That's what I was doing before. Where did I need these guards? Three insect bitten guards patrol the camp. And where do they come in? Um, two guards arrive at area one and one arrives at area five on the third round. So we need to have some guard tokens. Area one, two guards in area one, one area in area five. Let's grab some guard tokens. because this is really easy to do. Oh, we don't have any good pictures. That's totally fine. Um, how are we gonna do this? I'll just make a, uh, a really basic token here in token stamp. We'll, we'll do it white and we'll put some text in it to show you that you don't need anything fancy. So we'll go background color white. 
let's uh, add text. Don't want this number one. We're not making, whoops, we're not making numbers. Let's delete this. Can I delete this? There we go. And we'll call this guard. And we'll make the text color not yellow. Let's make it black. Let's move this here. There we go, that's all you need. And we'll save this. Guard underscore token. And then we just drag it into rule 20 and call it a day. Uh, actually, you know what I'm gonna do? Let's do this differently. I'm gonna put this on my tokens page so I stay organized. So I'll set everything up here. We'll make sure that it's the correct size so I don't have to do that in the game. And let's put a nameplate underneath of it. Guard. We'll go back to Mivens Rust. And I believe it said two in area one and one in area five. So let's put some guard tokens here. And let's say that they kind of emerge from the tents. Let's put those on the GM layer, and then one on area five uh, will kind of show up from the tents as well. There we go. Um, that might do it for this section. They're going to fight some stuff. They're going to find out that these stone warriors are after this egg, and that's kind of lead them into the next section. Um, going to allow them to say we can either go to the uh, recruitment section or into the darkness if they don't want a guide. It's going to give them an option of, hey, do you want to hire one of these NPC guides? Um, and we have three, I believe, three different candidates, um, all that have sort of some benefits and maybe some some drawbacks. I don't think any of them have any, um, any negative effects, but it's sort of like, uh, you know, you could, you could take this one, but it's giving up what you could get from the other one sort of a thing. Uh, and I, I'm pretty sure my players are going to do that because we only have two. And this is this adventure is supposed to be for four to five at level one. And so I have two players. I told them to make level two characters with the knowledge that they're probably going to have an NPC guide as well. So uh, I think that should be fine. Uh, in the darkness, the jungle uh, is this next section. We have some potential jungle encounters. I think what we'll likely do, we might run one of these and then... Um, we'll do theater of the mind for this just to save myself some time. Um, and this is not really the most important part of this adventure, but it does add to some realism and the, the threat of danger. Um, there is this mechanic about consuming water because you're surviving the heat. You're going through the jungle. Um, I think we'll probably do this like maybe once, uh, again, I think if I was going to run this as a as a an ongoing thing leading into a campaign, um, I could definitely see this stretching into two sessions. Since I'm trying to contain it into one, I might just skip over this stuff here, um, just to kind of keep it within a in a, a decent time frame and allow for enough time at the end for one big final fight. Uh, so, um, I do want to pay attention to these jungle locations. These are interesting. They're going to help add to some of the flavor. So this I will use uh, at least we'll probably roll once per traveling day to see. And we'll also probably get into some of this uh, consuming of water as well. You know what? Maybe I'm just going to skip one of these jungle encounters or maybe we'll just yeah, we might we might run it. We might run it in the theater of the mind. I'm definitely not going to pull up a whole nother map for it and make it a big thing. Uh, next section we move on to um, is the Raging River section. And that we actually do go to the map for. Um, here is, let's go to roll 20. That does move into, yeah, yeah, yeah. That does move into, um, this next map here, which I've done the same thing for. Whoops. I've gone and taken a look at this, this map here, which is, it's got all the labels on it. It's got these C's for crocodiles. It's got the sections numbered. Um, it has where the, the bad guys are. It has where the secret doors are. Um, and so obviously you don't want that to be seen by your players. I've taken all that information, put it into roll 20. 
And uh, the reason it looks darker here rather than this map is because since this map is entirely outdoors, there's no, we're not really worrying about line of sight in this case and having, you know, not being able to see something because you're behind a tent or something like that. We can do that. But as far as exploration goes, that's not really the main focus of this first map. So I didn't turn on dynamic lighting. I have, however, turned on, on, on dynamic lighting here. If you're going to do dynamic lighting with this map, obviously this, this PDF wasn't created in Roll20. This is not a Roll20 exclusive module. So you have to go and do this stuff yourself, which is fine. It's very easy. It's got nice, easy, straight line walls, some curbs, but you know, it's whatever. It's mostly big rectangles and stuff. So if I go to my uh, dynamic lighting tab, you can see I've already done all this. Um, the one thing I guess that's not on here is a secret door, um, a secret passage, but you know, whatever, I can go and uh, manage that if need be. I have run and put in all the walls though. Once I add character tokens here, it'll look a little different because then we're gonna be able to see where this dynamic lighting is affecting. Uh, so, uh, where was I? Going back out into the Raging River, we're, we're encountering some crocodiles, potentially, I think is the idea. Uh, you attempt to um, cross the river. The river counts as difficult terrain. Uh, let me just take a look here, because I'm not sure what the intent is. This is a, there is a bridge here. Um, a crackling, groaning bridge sewn from rotting animal hide swings 10 feet above the water. I think the intent here, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's further into this bullet points. I think I would have it would have started with this bullet point feature here that, hey, uh, just FYI, there's a bridge. If you try to cross it, it's a DC 15 acrobatics check or you fall off. Um, and then you can make a DC 13 deck save to grab onto the edge. Uh, then there's crocodiles. So we'll need to have, I don't think we need to have uh, tokens for these crocs, but I do want to know what these stats are. And fortunately, it's another big nod to how well uh, organized this is. All the stat blocks are included. Oh, what happened here? Oh, okay. It went to, I thought it was going to link me to further in the PDF. I thought for sure this would be at the bottom. Well, that's, maybe it is. No, only, it's probably because this is not a, it's not a new creature. It's just, it's an existing creature and it's linked to someplace else. That makes sense. So I think for my own sake, I'm going to pull this up in, uh, in D and D beyond. So let's do that. Crocodile. Um, it probably doesn't really matter. It's just a, they're, they're probably just getting bitten once or twice. It's not going to be something where we need to have tokens for them. But uh, it is still a thing. I think we'll probably add that because it's kind of fun, even though it's it's a little bit of a time, a little bit of time consuming, I guess. It's it's still interesting flavor. Um, okay, let's get some ideas for combat. Crocodiles leap from the water and make the bite attack. Um, they won't exit the river. Crocodiles flee if reduced to half their hit points or below. So as long as characters stay out of the water, they're fine. It's just a cool little thing. Uh, so we move on. Uh, the temple, we've got a really good description. Um, we have some descriptions of how they could possibly enter in. Uh, a little bit of the development. You know, it, hey, if they start making a bunch of noise, then their presence has been alerted and they're going to be attacked probably. Um, if they do start checking around, there are rations and barrels of fresh water. Uh you know, if, if I need to, I could also say that there's, you know, a potion of healing or something like that. I think they could find these in, um, it might be in this storeroom here. Let me take a look. Yeah, that's in area one, the storehouse, uh, which is this tower up here. There's nothing threatening in this storehouse. It's just supplies. Uh, area two of the statue room. It's this first room they enter in. It's it's the, the easiest and most obvious place to go to. Uh, there's no, uh, you know, sort of check to get inside there. It's just a room full of stone warriors that are in the process of performing some ritual. Um, 
and they are ready uh, ready to fight as soon as they notice the characters. So they survive this. Uh, Stone Warriors fight to the death. Um, they, there's small treasures. They notice some other things. We move on to area three. I'm going to pull up. I'm a little bit disorganized at the moment. Where is my other... Okay, moving on to area three, which is this uh, immediate area past this big arched door, which I believe, if I remember in the PDF here, I don't think there's any sort of weird check. The rolling J door opposite the entrance. Right, they don't have to do anything special. They just go through the door. Um, in area three, uh, there's a large bronze statue uh, of a big uh, basilisk, basically. Gong and a mallet hang from its teeth. Two bronze arches opposite the uh, each other on either side of the hall. Here and here. Um, lead to adjacent rooms. Uh, no effect for the gong. There is an unlocked secret door to the north. You can find the wall by a DC 20 investigation check. Um, they do find a potion of healing inside the statue, however, if they took time to examine it. I think this is just a sort of a, a, a down, you know, there, there's nothing majorly exciting here except for the potion, except for the secret door. Uh, area four and five. Area four is a sleeping quarters um, with the possibility of getting into this final back room, this big secret uh, ritual room. Uh, can be accessed either through the secret door here or this little refuse chamber uh, that connects. These two squares connect. Um, the downside is, though, there is gelatinous cube at the bottom of this little connected pit. But, yeah, it's one way, it's one way in. Um, I don't think there's anything of interest other than that here. Let's take a look. Uh, not particularly. The gelatinous cube contains a corrosion-resistant diary worth 20 gold pieces to a scholar or collector with the following legible entries. So they could find a bit of information. Um, area 5, however, is a trap room. It is the burial chamber. Let's take a look at this vicious room. If I can find where my tabs are. There's a problem when you're running D&D online on multiple monitors is you end up having like 18 tabs open. Uh, this ritual room is very cool. Is uh, essentially, um, it's got a bronze. I'm going to put this on the other page so we can see it. And I'm still going to read it. Um, a bronze arch, an open bronze arch leads into this room. A sealed sarcophagus rests at the back, uh, which is this here. A murky pool with a basilisk face sits in front of it. Debris, river reeds, and silt cover the floor. Um, so we have a couple of things to interact with. We've got all this weird debris. We've got a pool with a, um, a basilisk face in front of it. And then we've got the sarcophagus. Um, if they, well, they notice that in this arched doorway are tracks that kind of line the interior of this arch that look like it could fit a door. It looks like a doorway could fit here. Um, they find human bones sort of scattered in the debris. And if anybody opens this sarcophagus, you find this desiccated corpse in decorative garb clutching a stone basilisk egg. Uh, opening the sarcophagus, however, triggers the trap. Uh, the door slams shut. You can, you can, excuse me, lift it with a successful strength check. Um, but then the room starts filling with water via this pool. And four skeletons among the debris come to life and attack the party so they have a couple things to contend with they've got a room filling with water and skeletons skeletons on their on their own aren't terribly difficult i think they're cr one fourth but you've got this timed trap um hey guys the room's filling up with water what are we doing who's gonna stop this and uh the way that they could stop this i believe uh let's take a look here it fills the room entirely in three rounds. Um, the PDF also reminds us of, of how to calculate how long characters can hold their breath. Um, I think, yeah, the way to, to get out of this is to just to open the door back up. So it's going to be a, uh, that's how they have to do it. I don't think that shutting the sarcophagus 
does anything. Uh, doors and mechanism can be disabled by anyone with thieves tools. Oh yeah, um, so you can either strong arm, shove the door open, or you can thieves tools sort of disable the trap, make it a lot easier to lift. Uh, but this, yeah, this is the trap room. And then finally in area number six is the hatchery. This is where it all kind of culminates. Um, trees and massive roots erupt through the walls and floor of this room. Another uh, pool at, at the top of low steps dominates the center of the room. An enchanted jade hutch with a hollow in the center. Uh, off to the far corner, which I have put on the GM's layer is a stone shaman lying in wait and there are three basilisk hatchlings kind of roaming about um there there is the possibility of a, a basilisk hatchling being released onto the party on the first map as well that i think i forgot to mention um now part of the con uh, continuation of the narrative from the first map uh if these stone warriors manage to successfully escape with that egg from the dig site players are going to find it here in this hollow in the center um, and it will hatch in 1d6 rounds if not removed which adds another element another bassless hatchling to the fight um, stone shaman stays in half cover amongst the trees to cast a bane on the combatants who engage the rear basilisk so anybody that's coming to fight like this one for example um, is going to get hit with a bane effect then he targets anyone nearby with inflict wounds uh so that's gonna be a fun fight uh once the the players defeat all this nonsense the jade hutch is worth 50 gold pieces uh they can also recover the egg which is worth a good amount the stone shaman has a tiny brass vial in a pouch that is an ever smoking bottle um i need to pull that up because i don't entirely remember what that is uh let's open a new tab that's what you do when you run D&D, is you have 17 tabs open at once. Ever smoking bottle. I honestly have never seen this in 5th in edition. It's probably exactly what it says. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, cool item. Um, once the players exit the temple, we go to sort of the final section, the big twist, which is... Um, one of the NPCs uh, that they, well, probably the NPC that they, they uh, came along with, um, or maybe one that they didn't pick from the first section will show up and essentially be like, hey, thanks for doing all the legwork. Why don't you give me that uh, basilisk egg? Why don't you turn over all your goodies? Um, and so I might have to like make them a little bit more threatening because it's going to essentially be, you know, three adventurers versus one adventurer and they might not be so interested in giving this up so um it's i think this is meant to sort of parlay into like the possibility of a future adventure but the players can sort of negotiate uh see if they're going to actually give this up and this is kind of tailing into the end of the adventure where the players can give chase to this npc that depraved uh, betrayed them um or they can return back to the camp um see you know how you could uh, parlay this into another adventure um we're just doing this at a one shot so this is where it's going to end so i think we're all ready to go we have a couple of interesting things we've got this uh, starting camp players are going to start combat right out of the gate see that it's dangerous and threatening we'll give them a chance to talk to some npcs maybe hire a uh, a guide we'll go through some uh, some jungle narrative, some potential random encounters that will just be theater of the mind. We'll finally get to the temple and they'll cross this ladder or cross this bridge made out of uh, animal hide and uh, hopefully not fall in or else they'll get, you know, chomped on by some gators. And uh, then we fight some cultists. Simple adventure. Really uh, pretty easy. Um, pretty straightforward. And I really appreciate the way that this is all laid out. So uh, I hope this goes well. Thank you for following along. Uh, next week, we should be back for Spelljammer D&D uh, &D prep. Um, I know that it's been some time since I've done one of these. Um, just like D&D, &D, life happens to get in the way of uh, me wanting to record stuff. And um, I think now that I've committed to running something every week, I should be able to get back on a more regular basis. Uh, so whether or not it's Spelljammer or the next campaign or whether it's a one-shot, 
we'll have something ready to go. Uh, so maybe down in the road, in, down down the road in the future, we'll see more. Uh, we'll, we'll be able to showcase more one shots that I find uh, on the internet. Maybe we'll stick with uh, all the stuff from the Arcane Library for some time. Uh, if this goes really well and players like it, maybe we'll just get to showcase all the Arcane Library one shots and see how I prep for them, and then say that hey, these were amazing ten out of ten awesome adventures. Uh, or you know, if they're if they're not good, I'm not going to say that they weren't good. I'll just talk about something else um so and it could just be very well that uh you know different different folks different tastes but anyways thank you for watching i hope this was helpful in some regard uh and very least entertaining uh thank you and we'll see you next time all right and i'm back to do a quick review of this module now that it's been a couple of days and i've had a chance to think about our session uh, jot down my notes and uh, I'm going to get into it. We're going to talk a little bit of about the cons, the pros, the neither good nor bad, and then I guess I'll give you my overall thoughts on it. Um, and it's not even really like I have a whole lot of hard criticisms. It's more or less uh, some minor things here and there as well as uh, it's probably just my opinion based on what I like to run and what my players are used to. So let's get into it. Uh, first, I think in, in my experience, I guess, well, let me, let me start by saying that we didn't get through the entire thing. Um, we got almost to the very end. I had to cut some things for time. Um, we essentially ended by getting to this final chamber where they fight some stuff and they fight the basilisk catchlings and the stone shaman, um, the, uh, the, the final big shaman guy. Um, and that's where we kind of had to end because we were at the end of our session and, um, you know, we weren't going to start, uh, at the very end of the session with rolling initiative to have another hour long combat. And this wasn't like the type of one shot that I felt that we wanted to continue on into multiple sessions anyways. Um, so that's how far I got into it. We didn't finish, finish it, but we got all the way to the end. Uh, so the first, the cons, um, I think in, in my opinion, this is potentially a lot deadlier than it looks at first glance. Um, now we, uh, yeah, I know this adventure says four to five players at first level, knowing that we were only going to have two and they were going to have an NPC guide with them. I had them start at level two. So we had two players at second level and we nearly TPK multiple times in this, in this adventure. So I, I think it would be, um, just as difficult for four to five first level characters. Um, I think that's largely because this is an, this is a very combat heavy one shot. We start off right out of the gate with multiple enemies, uh, all trying to either set fire to the camp or, uh, just occupy the player's time while they, uh, while other, uh, of the other of these cultists, these stone warriors hop down into the, um, excavation site and steal this jade egg. Um, then further on, we've got, uh, multiple days of travel through the jungle to get to the temple. Um, so there's some uh, potential random encounters through the jungle. There's some resource management if you want to do that. We ended up cutting that stuff for time. Well, I cut that stuff for time. Um, and then you've got the issue with the crocodiles. And then finally, uh, once all that's done, whoops, I wanted to load this map. Then we get into the temple where there's more combat and more combat. Uh, so I think this potentially could be a pretty deadly uh, adventure especially if you're just running with a group of new players at first level. Um, I think also the DC for some things were a little bit high, um, specifically the trap room in the final temple um, is kind of deadly. This is like a, this is a pretty dangerous trap room. There's not a whole lot to interact with when you go into it. You see this pool with a little basilisk head sticking up out of it and you've got some debris poking around the room and uh, it's pretty clear that there's supposed to be some sort of door in this little open archway. There's a slot for a door. And you can even, you know, ask for passive perceptions and say somebody notices that if you really want to make it obvious. And there's this closed sarcophagus that looks exactly like the one that they dug up at Mivens Rest. So there's really not a whole lot for them to interact with. They're going to poke the red button. They're going to, un, you know, they're going to take the lid off the sarcophagus, trigger the trap. And then you're going to fight some skeletons and the room's going to start filling up with water. The only way out of this trap, however, is to, as far as I could tell, based on the adventure is either if you have thieves tools to make it a little easier, uh, or just somebody with a high enough strength, um, 
requires a DC 18 strength check to disable. Uh, otherwise, you're just stuck in this room that's filling up with water, and eventually you're you're dead. I know that's that that one seemed kind of high. There might have been a few other ones. Um, so I, I think I might have adjusted that a little bit. Uh, or given some other way to disable this trap. Maybe, um, you know, there's some hidden lever at the bottom of the pool or something like that. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but I, I did think that one was particularly high. Um, there is some fairly punishing paths, uh, especially at this final temple. There's really not much for, for the way of different paths that you can take here in, um, in Miven's Rest. Um, I suppose, do I have this mentioned later on? Yeah, I'll mention this later on with Miven's Rest. Let's go back to the temple because I think here there's some pretty punishing paths. Uh, now you have this uh, circular, I guess, uh, this is like the stash, you know, this is where you can find some resources, find some stuff to make it a little easier. But uh, my party saw stairs and they went, we're marching in and we got a job to do. Um, so there's a couple of ways, I guess there's really only one way in here and that's to go straight up the stairs and in. Um, but I guess the one path that is a little bit punishing is, uh, to, to get to this final, this final chamber here, um, unless you make it pretty obvious and make it a little, I guess, less of an impossibility to, to find this secret door, the only way into this final chamber, which is taking place after maybe you got bit by some crocodiles, after you fought some stone warriors, probably after you got trapped in this trap room and fought some skeletons, nearly died from, from drowning, um, then find, well, here's this little refuse deposit chute. Um, maybe that leads in there. Let's go through there. And uh, as written, there's a gelatinous cube in there, which at for first level characters, that's pretty intense. Um, and then, and then you finally... After all that, get to fight more stuff, some basilisk catchlings and stone and a stone shaman. Um, now, as uh, as we ran it, I took out the gelatinous cube entirely because I thought that was pretty punishing, and I just gave them access to the journal that you can find in this this area. Um, and then I made it a little bit obvious. I kind of used the NPC that they were traveling with, um, Gran Reskin. Uh, she was kind of instructing the characters to go search for other secret passages or doors or traps or something like that. Um, so, and our party rolled high enough that they found the secret door, so that wasn't an issue. Um, I think, uh, yeah, one thing I wanted to mention here, I think if I was going to change anything, um, I think I might, I might have scaled back on how intense this trap room was, and I would turn this central room here, uh, room number three, into a puzzle. You know, involve this basilisk statue with the eggs. Because um, the eggs seem to be an important theme here in this adventure. Make it a puzzle. Um, maybe you have to find enough eggs and put them in the right, you know, the right claw or something. I, I don't know. Um, but something that allows the players to do some exploration, use some deductive reasoning, interact with this room, and then that opens up this secret door. Rather than it just be a simple check. I think that's what I would do and make this, um, you know, a little less just uh, combat uh, heavy. Uh, now onto the pros, because obviously this was a good, we had a lot of fun doing it, and um, as a f completely free adventure, I mean, it's it's top-notch value. Uh, the PDF uh, is extremely well organized. Let me just grab, uh, I think I can, I mean, it's for free. I think I can, I think I'm okay to uh, pull this onto, onto the screen here. Um, so this is the, the full-color, non-printer-friendly version. You do get a full black-and-white printer-friendly version as well. Um, it's a nice table of contents, obviously. Everything's organized pretty well. Um, we've got this great bullet point synopsis up front. Most of the stuff in this adventure isn't a big, long wall of text you have to read. It's quick bullet points that you don't need to memorize. That you can just, at a glance, look at and then narrate however you want to narrate it as, as a dungeon master. Um, we've got you know some bullet points for background, uh, some instructions on kind of how to run this and what everything looks like. Um, there's even... This is so fantastic, and I'm so glad that uh, Arcane Library does this. You can go watch a 15-minute video on how this adventure runs, what it is, that goes through the whole PDF and explains it. And that's for free. That's on the YouTube channel. Pretty fantastic. Um, you know, it gives you this idea about pacing and these dramatic questions at the end. 
Uh, everything is really well organized. I appreciate this quite a bit. Um, let me get back to my notes. Here we go. Uh, the maps. Maps are fantastic. You get two really beautiful, full color, well done maps with this adventure. I think, I think at the very end, you also get them as files um, to, uh, you know, using your VTTs. You get both the, uh, the labeled version like this, as well as the for players only version. So you can go in and put this in yourself. Um, and I showed these on the stream too, so or on the uh, the first part of the video, so you know what these look like. These are fantastic. This is top notch quality that we're getting for a, from a free adventure. So um, I got nothing but good things to say about this uh, about these maps. Um, what else next? Uh, I think this would be pretty. I ran this uh, on roll twenty, but I think this would be equally easy to run in person, just because of how much um, you're, you're given. Um, uh, it, not not just with the maps and the pdfs but there's also uh let me go over i don't need that folder uh, i think i i might have had this open one second i apologize um if we go into let me go into the folder here yeah i sh i showed these i think uh, a little bit in the first section of the video um but we've got these full color um these pc combat cards so you can have your party you know you can print these out cut them up and have you know hand these out to your your party especially if they're new players this might make it a little easier um zoom in a little bit and you know they can put down the you know their basic essential stats ac hit points past perception all their information um and we've got also these item cards um and these might be combat cards my mistake uh these combat cards for you as the dungeon master um so you don't have to go and you know pull up on your tablet or your phone from uh dnd beyond these stats it has it right here these nice uh printable combat cards um everything's right here it's nice and easy and, I, and a lot of this stuff is sort of shortened um some really easy to understand shorthand for this stuff so it makes your prep time probably a lot faster if you're going to run this in person they just have to print some stuff out and and cut it up but like no that's not going to take a whole lot of time uh next uh yeah plenty of content holy crap there's so much here that we had to cut stuff to fit it into three hours um easily you could easily run this uh, over two sessions i think um we didn't really cut out important things but i guess where we did shorten it a little bit um because i, I you know i have players that are accustomed to more rp heavy D. &D. And so I still wanted to have a little bit of that and allow for some moments of, it's a one shot, but they, I think I still have players that like to have some character information. So I allowed for that. So we naturally had to cut back on some things. What we did cut back on, um, where is my PDF? Is uh, mostly, not the aftermath, where is it? Is uh, these random encounters. Um, the way that I ran it is uh, I assumed it was going to take like two to three days and I had players roll a D8 to see what jungle locations they ran into. Um, they were, they're trying to track down and, and follow this trail based on scent. They saw these stone shaman or these stone warriors steal the jade egg and dart off into the, into the jungle. And so they were trying to track them based on scent and, um, you know, so I had players roll on this table and I said, okay, well, we come across, you get a little lost and you find this uh, open patch of quicksand, you know, and it kind of sets you back. Um, well, I had them do a, uh, you know, we rolled perception checks for watches and I had a player uh, roll a D8 and they saw this giant constrictor snake kind of slither down out of the trees uh, and kind of eye them up uh, in camp. And I allowed this rule of cool moment where uh, the player used... It was like the it wasn't a spell. I think it was the the natural ability to communicate basic ideas with a small creature. And uh, even though it's a giant constrictor snake, I went real cool and made them roll a persuasion check or something. Um, and they also used a uh, a minor illusion to conjure a like a sewer rat to hopefully go get that snake to chase that instead of them. Uh, so it was a really cool moment. But I still wanted to do that both for. Uh, flavor purposes to show that this is a dangerous and deadly jungle um, 
you know, and to, uh, you know, have a little bit of the, the flavor that kind of fits in with the theme. Um, what else did we really cut back on? That was kind of the main thing. Um, and also the gelatinous cube uh, was, was cut out because I thought that was a little bit, a little bit punishing. Um, also, maybe we're moving on to the next section of my notes. That's not what I wanted to pull up. Apologies. Where this is what happens when you run D and D. You have way too many windows open. Uh, so yeah, plenty, plenty of content. Uh, again, as a free adventure, you know, uh, the value is is most certainly there, and I think this would be really easy to parlay it into a larger campaign. Um, now, naturally, this is a jungle setting, and so it's not going to fit into every single campaign. Uh, you couldn't really start Rhyme of the Frost Maiden with this adventure, for example, since that one is set entirely in the tundra. Um, but this does fit really easily into a lot of uh, different settings. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty uh, campaign agnostic, I'll say, except for obviously, like I said, specific setting campaigns. Um, now on to the last section. This is just how it is. It's neither good nor bad. This is going to be mostly just personal preference uh, with a couple of uh, my own notes at the end. Um, I think, well, this is a pretty combat heavy adventure. Uh, as as I pointed out, we start off with a lot of combat with, uh, I think it's like eight, to 10 different things popping in and fighting the characters. Then we roll up, we move on to uh, the jungle multiple day overland travel where you could have more random encounters. Um, then you fight, you know, you potentially have to mingle with some crocodiles if you don't make it over this bridge. Okay. Um, then there's these, you know, and I cut some of the stone warriors. I think there's supposed to be like six in here, but, uh, being that we have two players and I didn't want them to get completely overwhelmed and turn around. Um, you know, I cut the number down to four, uh, and there's skeletons and traps and gelatinous cube, and there's more combat in the final room. And it just felt for us, for my party and myself that we're used to like a, a lot of RP and exploration and then one big combat per session to have a bunch of little combats and it's like every every 20 minutes or so where we're like rolling you know initiative even if it's not a big combat even if it is just theater of the mind or something small you do kind of need to keep track of who's going in what order it, it i wouldn't say that it was it was too much it just was a little bit not what we we're accustomed to um in the first combat this was maybe something that needs to be tweaked or at least be aware of um there's i know that there are guards and i did have guards exit the tents as they were getting set on fire and try to help out in combat um the one thing that sort of doesn't make sense to me is like i don't the, the, we don't really have stat blocks i don't think for these npc guides that are, are uh, a potential option let me just pull up the pdf one more time so i in case that i'm completely wrong on this um, I guess we do kind of have stat blocks in the way of, you know, I can click on this and it takes me to scout or spy or thug, for instance. Um, but there's, and I certainly, I guess I could have, uh, included them in the combat myself. Um, there's, there's, if I'm just brand new DM looking at this PDF, however, there's nothing that tells me, oh yeah, they come out and fight on round two or whatever. Um, so it, it was knowing that, knowing that I didn't do that, knowing that it was uh, supposed to happen after the fact, I felt in the moment it would have been really weird for these uh, potential guides that are, you know, well traveled. They know how to survive in the jungle. Uh, after all the tents are burned down and then and the campsite got got uh, attacked, for them to pop out and be like, "Hey, we're ready to help now," and the party's like, "Hey, where were you when shit was going down?" You know. <laughs> so I, I thought that would have been weird. So that's why I had uh, Grand Reskin follow them and accompany them into uh, into the temple. Let's see. Lastly, and this is a bit of a um, a weird narrative thing here. Um, you do have the option. The players could prevent these stone warriors that come out uh, into Area Five and try to steal the jade egg. It could be that characters stop that from happening and then they don't see the jade egg in the final temple stage and um, if they have the egg it is sort of narratively weird because you might have characters that 
uh, aren't exactly motivated by anything beyond getting riches and all that. Um, I know this is a one shot, so we can still have this idea that, you know, the players know that this is the thing that we're doing. So we come up with reasons for why the characters are going to do that. But um, it, it does kind of take a little bit of character incentive out of it. If you've kind of already solved one small problem here, um, and especially if, if Grand Reskin isn't very privy to uh, what's going to happen at the temple, what, what ultimately they're trying to do, if it's still just conjecture and theory and ghost story, um, then Gren herself may not be enough of a motivation for the characters. So um, what I ended up doing, and I know I'm getting a little wordy on that, but I think I'm, I'm getting the point across, is I had these warriors hold back they didn't make themselves known. They were kind of waiting in the, the outskirts of the jungle until the characters were sufficiently occupied or uh, tied up or, or at low enough of, a, of hit points in the combat um, to then pop out. Two of them stood at the edge to watch guard while the third hopped down and grabbed the egg. And uh, so characters did have one round where they could follow them if they wanted to, but they weren't close enough at that point. And I really wanted to have that narrative without completely railroading it. I wanted characters to have an opportunity to notice that they were there and see that they're about to get away and then make a decision as to how they're going to do it. Um, but I did ultimately want to have the, uh, the warriors succeed in stealing the egg because that gives a, a wider base of players, a wider base of characters incentive to go after it, whether it's appeal to adventure or appeal to, uh, you know, treasure and loot um, or the bigger scheme of like, you know, hey, there's a cult that stole an egg and uh, they're probably going to do some bad stuff with it. They dug up uh, a, a pretty regal and royal looking body and stole an egg. Uh, this is probably important. We should probably go stop whatever they're doing. Um, so I, that's that's the way that I ran that is I kind of narratively forced that a little bit um, so that I could avoid it being really weird. Like, well, what happens if they stop it and now the players have the egg and they think that's the big final reward and you know then i have to kind of like retcon a bunch of stuff that grand reskin definitely does know instead so um that was that was a little bit of a weird moment um that i i guess it, it could have been a weird moment um overall however very very good good adventure you get tons of stuff uh for once again completely for free and if you go to the arcane library a lot of these adventures which i'm sure are of equal if not better quality than this free adventure um are they're like a couple dollars you know it's it's incredibly good value so i i can't speak highly enough about it and i will definitely be checking out some of the other adventures this one is the first level um there are ones i think ranging all the way up to 20th level uh so there's a whole wide range of uh of, of adventures no matter what you're looking for and i think they all have videos too which is pretty awesome um so you can even if you're thinking about an adventure and you're like that looks interesting based on the title based on the cover i like the theme of that based on the title you can go to the arcane library's youtube channel and look at this 10 minute video on the adventure and go okay that's definitely really cool i'm gonna you know plop down the the four or five dollars or whatever for that adventure um so you get a little bit of a a trial from the creator herself before you, you before you buy a little bit of a cool preview um so yeah lots of content beautiful maps uh plenty of stuff to do man there is plenty of, you you won't lack for things to do in your session if you're running this as a single session one shot i can guarantee that for sure um unless you're running a six hour one shot in that case, I, I'm not confident that this could fill up six hours, but I don't think most of us are doing that, uh, especially if you're running online. Um, anyways, uh, I got to say, very good adventure, solid eight out of 10 for me. Um, the only thing that could have made it better, those minor tweaks and just personal preference is being a very combat heavy adventure. So all that said, thank you for watching the entire thing, including the prep and this little review. Um, we'll see you in the next video.